very own uh, part, part of, uh, of the of the paper zero team uh, is going to be presenting uh, about whether is there a case for industrial policy in the 21st century. Um, Kirill is doing his PhD in development development studies in the Center of Development Studies here in our university, and his uh, supervisor is Professor Hayden Plant, who is a very well known uh, authority in the, in the market. So uh, it is good. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I think yeah, I think it's a really good occasion or way to celebrate or kick off the Halloween. <laughs> just just more industrial policy uh, lectures. Um, so yeah, I mean this is so this is the topic of today's lecture is actually focusing on uh, whether industrial policy is feasible in upcoming century. Uh, there are there's quite a lot of there is quite a lot of debate and discussion how feasible it's in the age of globalization. So this is kind of the focus of this lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a bit of the historical context and what industrial policy means. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges uh, that are specifically uh, mounted for industrial policy in the context of globalization rather than general uh, theory. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the issues that those arguments face and maybe uh, then build a case or, how, uh, or present how the case is built by some people in the literature on whether it is actually uh, perhaps a very feasible uh, f and reasonable thing to do. <clears throat> so uh, the first question to ask is what is industrial policy? And it's a bit more than just building uh, manufacturing, building factories, although the meaning, to understand the meaning of it, we probably should start with uh, industrial revolution. Um, so, although industrial policy is, has some roots that reaching uh, further into the past, uh, industrial revolution is a pivotal event in the sense that it made realize, uh, made some people and policymakers realize why it is important to have uh, the factory system and modern industry. And so the, this is the first picture here, and that's, that's the uh, picture of Manchester, and you see a couple of factory chimneys, etc. Nothing too impressive it might seem, but at the time, 150 years ago, it was all the rage uh, in Europe, since what uh, the factory system meant is that you can, you could employ a lot of people, a lot of modern technologies and machinery in one place to create Un unseen amounts of industrial produce. It made people more integrated into labor markets in very large quantities. People who are usually uh, before subsistent farmers uh, made you know, earnings of firstly of capitalists but then also of the uh, workers higher. So it reduced poverty dramatically. It made England prestige go through the roof and it made it powerful not only economically and in terms of trade but also in terms of the uh, uh, military produce. This is, I mean, this is, uh, we, this was the age of, you know, continuous warfare and to be able to produce modern, uh, you know, artillery uh, and other sorts of firepower at such large quantities was essentially making you the world's hegemon it was making you, you know, the, the, very, the very powerful nation and so you could uh, use that capacity, well, to establish your dominance. And this was understood by some people and so industrial policy was an attempt to induce industrialization uh, through the policy. So it was, the idea was not to wait around for market and capitalists to build industri the industry for you, but rather do it. And one of the first proponents of, uh, of theoreticians of how to do it was Alexander Hamilton, uh, who was the first uh, uh, the uh, treasury of the state in the US uh, after gaining independence. And now is very alive in the pop culture, as some of you might have heard maybe some pieces from the Hamilton musical lately. So that's the guy. Uh, so he was, he's the author of the infant industry argument. So that's the, that's, those are the main points uh, of the main meaning of the uh, industrial policy. So it has been used as this policy-induced industrial way to induce industrialization through uh, policy 
or then induce industrial upgrading, further industrial development. And key characteristics of that are that the industrialization becomes government-led or led through government policy, often defying markets. Um, that the other one is that you want to induce structural transformation. So you want to go from this agrarian society where most of your work, uh, most of your labor force are peasants who just provide food for themselves and don't really trade as much or trade little in terms of value to actually be able to trade those large quantities of very valuable produce, which was the, you know, all sorts of manufacture, manufacturing goods or maybe even industrialize agriculture and also make it more commercial. And the last point is that it is sector selective, meaning you don't want to be best at everything. You prioritize some strategic sectors and you can prioritize them for export earnings. You can prioritize them because they induce further industrialization. Like think, for example, about steel mills or cement factories, which allow you to build new factories or, or uh, like steel are intermediate good for many other goods, you know, cars, whatever, like uh, a lot of stuff. So, or <laughs> uh, historically really importantly for you to build guns. Uh, so you want to prioritize your armament uh, sectors. And usual sort of policies employed for that were investment and often state would invest directly where there would not be enough capital in the country or state would shape where the investment would go. Uh, uh, so if, the, if it would have strong enough uh, domestic capital or it would direct foreign capital into those priority sectors. Then it was, there was a great deal of uh, protectionism. So that was something that Alexander uh, Hamilton was, uh, for example, big on. So you are protecting some of those raising sec sectors, raising industries and factories because they weren't as established as some of the foreign competitors. So if you were to compete without tariff protection, you would get slaughtered and all of that effort would go to waste. Uh, so you wanted in that infant phase, and it's called, that's why it's called infant industry protection, you wanted to nurture them, protect them. Uh, and then the, there are also technological policies, which are quite important more in modern times. Back in the day, it was buying patents. Before that, it was poaching workers who are skilled, etc. So the, 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 I'm sorry for this aesthetics of this picture, but this is actually one of the best summaries of why you use uh, protectionism and industrial policy at large. As you can see, strategic industries and very, that's very uh, well-made point by drawing a tank in there. Also, infant industry, sunset industry, so scaling down industry, you know, just not, not just closing uh, steel uh, uh, factories in Sheffield and hoping, you know, the uh, workers or miners will go into investment banking in London. Uh, or domestic unemployment, and this part of it is thinking about this uh, transition from, uh, of workers from ag ag agriculture to industry and urbanization and balance of trade. So uh, this, uh, the use of industrial policy has, uh, has stopped, has been scaled down in 1980s when it was uh, perceived to fail. Uh, and the reason for it is that a lot of the countries in the third world war, in the third uh, uh, world, went, uh, uh, started to have a lot of uh, economic problems and most dras dramatic of this was the third world debt crisis. And a lot of people were seeing uh, the uh, industrial policy as the cause of this debt crisis, meaning a lot of this investment was very expensive. There was a lot of borrowing of also from foreign partners. And then uh, the industries that were built were actually not competitive and they did not generate enough revenue to pay for those loans. So you uh, ended up with being insolvent. Uh, and also it was seen that often this protection of industries just generated people who lived or the, the uh, uh, industries that lived of the government handouts, essentially the subsidies that government was giving them. There was no uh, motive to actually acquire, to be internationally competitive. There was a motive to lobby government to stay that way. 
Uh, so in the new policy consensus policy paradigm, there was no role for industrial for uh, activist industrial policy, and that is best captured by the quote uh, that this is the title of this is the title of a column by Gary Becker, uh, who won a well Nobel Prize in the economics uh, for work on something else. But that's that essentially summarizes this new consensus uh, well that the best industrial policy is none at all. You don't want to have all to have those uh, problems by using industrial policy. Then there was actually a bit of uh, reversal in that consensus when people started to look at Japan and East Asian Tigers, which successfully industrialized and achieved the rich country status during that time. Interestingly enough, without much input from uh, the development economists uh, from the uh, from the post-world period, which were very active in Latin America and Africa. And there was this new literature on developmental state and the East Asian model of, uh, of development. But then again, East Asia also gave up on it uh, in 90s. So people started to say, well, that's actually it for the era of industrial policy, because we arrived at the age of globalization. And now, so now I'll look at three uh, key, uh, let's say, broad uh, ways of arguing why it is no longer feasible in this in the era of globalization. So one of those is related to interconnectedness and trade and that is well captured by this book by Thomas Friedman uh, which which some might find important uh, interesting read I don't recommend it. Uh, the uh, but essentially the argument the made there is there is so much in interconnectedness, global supply, global supply chains uh, are just permeating every economy. So you are either participating in this free trade or you are North Korea. There is not, no really no escaping it. And so that's the first line of argument is talking about the, the uh, importance of global, that globalization handle shaping trade. So, uh, the protectionism is seen as like swimming against the current uh, and it creates all sorts of allocative inefficiencies. So um, a good way to understand it is that if you erect those uh, barriers to trade, if you, be, if you are protectionist, the costs of, uh, and you try to uh, invest in all sorts of industries up the stream, you are trying to build something that you're not good of, uh, you know, you're good at some agricultural production, why try to make computers? You, it will take you ages, it will cost a lot of money, and by the end of the day you won't be as good as, you know, US, if you're Ghana, you won't be as good as US or as Japan. Uh, so, and at the same time, uh, by erecting barriers to make all those products more expensive for your consumers, and intermediate goods more expensive for your producers, meaning like raw materials coming from abroad if you tax them. I mean, that's actually not, there is a lot in that argument, but I don't have really time to go into it. Uh, so essentially by lifting those, you achieve higher allocative efficiency. Some people specialize in uh, raw materials or uh, so say if you're making a car, some, uh, taking iron ore, some uh, mining iron ore, some are making steel, some are putting that steel into a car. Everyone is good at something else. And this, the usual, the theory that's usually uh, used for uh, making this line of argument, the Heckscholl in Samuelson uh, theory of comparative advantage, is say that this is, this is the sort of spe specialization that you have uh, based on relative factor endowments, which means in human language, if you have more, a lot of workers, but not many, uh, uh, not many machines, you, you use those workers in agriculture and other sectors that use a lot of workers, but not many machines. And you have many machines, but not that many workers, you produce those cars or other manufacturing goods. And if you get rid of all those trade barriers, by the end of the day, there will be actually wage equalization under the assumptions of the, of the theory, which means everyone will be earning pretty much the same and everyone's gonna be happy. Uh, the other line within this argument is that there is this global division of labor, meaning, there, as I mentioned before, you have all those global supply chains, uh, which, and you can't, really, you can't really escape them. You focus on the one that you're good at. Um, 
and you can't, there is no really way of opting out because the, the whole supply chain is too big. Maybe if you are China, you can kind of focus all those, if put all of those producers in your country, but probably still not be good, as good at some segments as others are. So there is always a reason for, for you to import some of the, some of the parts. Uh, they are also too complex. You, to have this, to acquire this sort of technology, that is now being used at production. If you're a government of third world country, how can you compete with Google? You don't have the same capacities. Uh, and you need global demand because you, your market will be quite limited. So you actually want to sell it globally because then you can produce more of that, uh, of whatever you are producing and sell it at the larger scale. If you have only a handful of people who can afford it, then you can't really build a factory for it. And so that's actually not neoclassical, but classical, uh, relates more to classical Smithian argument on division of labor, uh, which was pretty much what I just described. Now, uh, the second line, yeah, the second line uh, is that state has failed in production. And that's largely because this globalization created this global marketplace, which is so competitive and uh, where capital is more flexible than it was. So back in the day, when there was not enough capital lying around in your country or flowing internationally, state might, might have been the only institution that was uh, able to invest such a large sum of money to actually build a factory. Now that's not the case. Uh, and so compared to those people, compared to this private capital, state is actually much less efficient in investing. Uh, so, and the theory that's put behind this is that the uh, private investment is driven by those rational individuals who seek the, the best profit margins because that's their su the survival of their companies is based on it. And so, and they know the, the territory best, so the markets are efficient. Uh, it's, it's quite a technical argument, but also like, too, a bit too complex to actually go into it right now. Um, and if, if you want to know about it, just ask me any questions. And on the other hand, state has all sorts of lags in policy, you know, the, the whole thing about bureaucracy being inefficient, which is often true, and that state doesn't have sufficient knowledge. And even if it does, it's not driven by it, to which I'll turn in a second. Uh, and so what, when sta state actually tries to override the private sector, it ends up just taking the, the most useful resources, most skilled workers, uh, the best places and resources for, its, for itself, and it just pushes this more effective private investment out of the way, which just creates inefficiencies, in debt, etc. So it's not efficient. Uh, the other part of the argument is that nurturing national champions is no longer feasible. So that's the stuff that you know Japan was doing by creating you know Toyota or uh, or uh, the or Honda, uh, or Honda and the same with. You know, Korea also creating its uh, automobile uh, industry or its steel makers. You, uh, that's partially because state-owned enterprises have proven to be ineffective. That's because, as mentioned, their reason that they, they're, it's, it's not, they are not driven by profit margins. They can live off state handouts, so they don't need to be uh, efficient in terms of profits, but they, they need, may only need to be efficient in terms of getting this subsidy to survive from a state and uh, keeping the uh, barriers to trade longer than it's needed. And so you, the theoretical foundation for that is public choice theory, which essentially says if you're in a government uh, or if you're related to government in those state-owned enterprises, you're also a rational individual and what makes sense for you is to lobby for stuff not to change, to keep, you know, to keep your company alive through any means necessary, including uh, keeping subsidi subsidies alive or uh, engage or keeping your department, let's say, you know, the industrial policy uh, department or ministry uh, alive for too long by creating all sorts of excuses why it should exist. And then uh, there is a, a start with the last argument because that's really not neoclassical, but it's really important, is that the national champions are simply too small for transnational corporations. And now I want to keep this picture in mind, you to keep this picture in mind as I'll discuss it. Uh, the point for that is uh, uh, 
the fact that you have those transnationals who have acquired such brutal economies of scale in uh, their access of finance, in their control of the suppliers, uh, in, um, uh, in also getting all the, the, skillers, the most skilled workers, in uh, getting already technological know-how established that you and capturing the global market, that you with your tiny domestic market, as long as you're not China or India, can't really do anything about it. And, uh, uh, and good, so in that, with that, uh, connected to that picture, that's a really, Boeing and Airbus are really good uh, example of it because there, there, is, there is essentially a duopoly in a production of large commercial aircraft in the world, meaning there is no other firm than them that, produ that produces large, com large commercial aircraft despite the fact that some of them are trying, but uh, unsuccessfully. And <laughs> if you would try to just displace them from, their, from whatever they stand, you need to face the truth of the matter, that is, they control a lot of, global, of this global supply chain they belong to. So, if you, so think, let's think about that. If, I want, if, I'm, if I'm Chinese government, I just want to build uh, this new, to, to make this new enterprise that would build large commercial air aircraft. I, for example, I need a supplier for engines. There are three suppliers uh, for engines for aircraft in the world that control, well, they're also smaller, but three meaningful. Uh, say one of them is Rolls Royce, for example. So say I go to Rolls Royce and tell them, just sell me some of your engines. And then Rolls Royce would probably say, I, I don't want to, because if he would try to do business with me, Boeing and Airbus will say, okay, buddy, like you're, you're dealing with the competition, we don't want to have deals with you. And that way he loses his most important uh, customers. So you can't, so in that sense, you would also need to create all of the suppliers down the line, because uh, that would not be in the sphere of influence of those, of those uh, existing transnationals. Uh, and that's connected to the bigger point which, from which I then started here, that there is a, I like this concept of interregnum, which some of you might know from uh, this Polish sociologist, Zygmunt Bauman, which is that uh, in, in, during the modernity, the times of modernity state uh, was the locus, was the place where the, pa the uh, institutions and power merged. But right now, uh, state, is, has lost, there is a divorce of institutions and power. State no longer can impose its will on the structure of the global economy. It's shaped by other forces. And interregnum means that there is no new king who is, who is this single locus of institutional, of, of power, uh, institutional locus of power. And that's one of the reasons. State, state can't just say, okay, I'm gonna make my own producer because it's just too, he, he can't compete with those transnationals. He needs to negotiate with them, deal with them. And secondly, there is an efficient capacity to do so. Uh, so, I'm running low on time. <laughs> so, um, in, terms, in terms of policies, what you see is that because you rely ultimately on transnationals, if you want to belong to this global value chain, if you want to have some you know, some, some change from it, you need to accommodate them on some level. That's why you will, you, what you see is that most of the countries are cutting the corporate take, uh, tax rates because that attracts, that's, as the argument goes, that attracts new investment. And you just can't do it the other way. Uh, it's just, you just see it empirically. Uh, and the other thing is already, as I already mentioned, this technology is now way too complex for a state just to try to steal it or to, co or to compete with those largest, with those giants transnationals because they just, they, the whole model, and they have, they have usually more resources, which are uh, um, a, the, uh, what's the word? which are focused on developing newer technologies, often on protecting them, and the best you can do is to buy a patent from them, maybe. And the last one is the declining policy space, which is actually a bit more of the outcome of those views uh, that reinforces this mechanics. So 
I would I would now go to what sort of policies are advocated. So in terms in the uh, framework of international economy, uh, those sort of views, uh, uh, which you know, which were which we associate with terms uh, with the pro policy paradig paradigm of Washingtonian consensus, for example, of, or neoliberalism, meant that a lot of policies that were key to this orthodox classical industrial policy were banned. For example, non-tariff barriers after Uruguayan round of negotiation WTO. There was a proliferation of uh, multilateral and bilateral free trade agreements. Uh, and in many countries, uh, the, uh, the trouble with debt was dealt with by IMF by imposing uh, these conditionalities in uh, restructuring programs, which became to be known you know, as uh, most commonly as structural adjustment programs. And that, that gets us to the, and that co connects to the, this previous point, there is declining po policy space for a state due to some of those solutions. Um, and the point about IMF and those conditionalities gets us to how the uh, economic policy making has changed in, on the level of the state in the, uh, uh, after after 1970s and 80s, so it's it started largely with this. There is no alternative approach or Thatcher Reagan type reforms, and now it also exists in terms of austerity in the especially in the EU, where you tell states you know you need to balance. You can't invest too much. You can't subsidize uh, sectors. You need to balance your budgets. You need you can't. Uh, Engage in protectionism, etc. That that was applied also to struggle through uh, to the third world countries uh, during the debt crisis through structural adjustment programs, and those were pretty much the same. The same uh, logic was applied in the uh, post-communist countries during the transition through so-called shock therapy reforms, and then in the end, uh, you know, as the nail to the coffin of. Uh, this activist industrial policy, there was also a liberalization of policy in East and Southeast Asia, which were known to be this model of industrial policy. And that has, called, that has been called by Thomas Friedman of The World is Flat, uh, the author of The World is Flat, as the golden straitjacket. You, you put those restraints on the executive, on the state, and then you just wait for the wealth to come in through, from the value of those global value chains or, or, or of trade. Uh, Etc. So uh, those and those are some of the guys key uh, to all those developments. Uh, that's World Trade Organization, which I mentioned, created some of those, uh, banned some of those solutions in terms of trade. It, for example, banning non-tariff uh, protectionist measures such as quantitative restrictions. International Monetary Fund uh, that has been responsible through SAPs. And that guy, that handsome man, is Jeffrey Sachs who was going around uh, both uh, Latin America and Eastern Europe advocating some of those SAPs, and he has been extremely influential in convincing policymakers to adopt them. Now, there are some problems with it. The, uh, it was argued that you know, this golden straitjacket argument uh, was uh, arguing that this sort of policies would create unforeseen wealth and whatnot. However, there was unprecedented slowdown after the Second World War in terms of GDP per capita growth. Uh, and SAPs have proven to be really ineffective and were mostly disastrous. That is not in all cases. In some cases, there was fairly robust growth performance after initial decline. But um, there was no growth miracles, really. Uh, and on average, it was much worse. And to, you know, to add to add the uh, hurt to injury, the best performers during that age were the least neoliberal. And you think about those, those communist states that did not manage to fall, and China and Vietnam, and now are outcompeting the rest of the pack. Um, and also, the other argument against, which was put against import substitution industrialization, there was no convergence, when there is definitely no convergence now. It's actually the, any trends to convergence declined during that time. And, uh, actually, since uh, making the category of least developed states, there were only three countries. In 1971, there were only three countries out of 51 that left that category. That's, I think, 
Cape Verde, uh, Botswana, and Mauritius, I think, yeah. So not much progress there. And there are <laughs> bonus uh, problems which were exacerbated and sometimes were supposed to be solved by those free market policies, although not all of them. And we see inequality and crisis became, crisis became much frequent and there, were, there are many social tensions related to both above points and there is increased and with the increased uh, awareness of environmental degradation and man-made climate change, there is just no response to it in terms of markets actually solving it. Um, we, we know it exists, we know roughly what sort of stuff we do, but the economic system prevents us, if anything, from solving it. And here is, you have a bit of data on growth here to show how bad it was then in the 60s and 80s. Those are Quanta, those are the poorest 20%, that's the richest 20%, and those are in the middle. You see, those, this is the bad, you know, bad old days of import substitution and industrialization. And you see that all across the board, there was significant decline in growth rate and significant decline in convergence. Actually, there, that's the only quantile that was converging during that time to the richest. And before, that was almost everyone. Uh, those two and this one was equal, anyways. So, uh, the now I would like I would like to give kind of three types of cases that are being made for continuing industrial policies policy in the uh, 21st century. And I'm really bad on time. <laughs> so. First, uh, first type of uh, arguments that's being made is that uh, actually the orthodox sort of uh, types of uh, activist industrial policy that has been implemented in some of the uh, some of those countries that you'll see here on the list has worked pretty well and actually much better than in countries that didn't do them during the period of globalization. Uh, one case in point is China, which adopted a lot of Japanese-inspired. Uh, policy solutions, and there was this focus on embedded autonomy, uh, which I, unfortunately I can't go into details right now. Uh, and the China has also been nurturing and protecting uh, specific the, the strategic industries where to a great success. You, for example, have a high high speed railway built in uh, China by Chinese companies, and that's the one of the largest if not the largest network of high-speed rail in the world right now. And that's actually China started to adopt this industrial policy, East Asian style, only in the late 90s and early 2000s, before it was more this command planning uh, and the bit of neoliberal reform. And it created many of its own national champions. And out of Fortune 598 companies that belong to China, there are state-owned enterprises. So that's, that's pretty startling. Um, then there, were, there is, I mean, then the argument that's being made by some countries, well, that's possible because it's China, it's big, it has all the muscles, right? It can't wrestle WTO and IMF. But also there are a lot of smaller low income countries that have seen increasing, uh, uh, increasing their performance after adapting, also East Asian style, uh, industrial policy or some modifications of it, but Ethiopia just went full South Korea and uh, it, has, it has been actually growing in some, uh, at some points faster than China. It was one of the fastest uh, uh, growers in all of Africa. And it had all sorts of infrastructure spending and focusing on uh, specific sectors, the ones that were providing so-called capital goods, meaning like cement factories, right, to build new factories, that's capital good, good to uh, the sectors that uh, produce more factories, essentially, and cash cows, meaning sectors that are good for export earnings like shoes uh, and clothing, etc. And it went with, uh, it also kind of focused on economic diplomacy, so it actually, it is buddies with China and it wanted, it put a lot of Chinese, it invited a lot of Chinese to produce, pro, uh, produce in Korea, but also in some, some Western uh, shoe sellers, shoe retailers, for example. And it was imitating, there was this focus on establishing institutions which were, which were kind of spreading the corporate culture into uh, state bureaucracy, 
of Ethiopia. And that's not the only example. I mean, you have also countries like Ecuador and Peru doing similar stuff and also growing quite fast. Now, and that's also the sort of policies were also done by rich countries like US. And you might have heard about the work of Mariana Mazzucato, the entrepreneurial state, which was actually an outcome of a lot of earlier research showing that US government after, I mean, before Reagan as well, but also during and after Reagan was doing a lot of this network based uh, industrial policy, which was essentially making sure that a lot of inventions die, done by mostly military or universities will be commercialized by private sector. And the risk in doing so will be, so will be socialized, meaning that they will be minimized risk of actually those companies going bankrupt. And that's how they nursed Silicon Valley and other stuff. So there is the Silicon Valley there. That's actually Chinese uh, designed trains, high, high speed train. And this is the factory in Ethiopia. A very nice banner here. Uh, to be a China, Africa friendly and harmonious enterprise, whatever. So I mean, uh, apparently, like there was, there was quite, it's quite interesting fact. Apparently, there was uh, in this uh, economic democracy and deal broking. Uh, uh, yeah, Justin Lin, who is a famous Chinese economist, was heavily involved. So sometimes you find his portrait being hanged in the factories, uh, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Uh, so yeah, another point is that uh, industrial policy has been also the, the calls to adapt industrial policy to new realities. And I'm really sorry, I'm, so I'm running a bit late. I'll try to finish quickly. And uh, the, uh, so there is this acknowledgement that industrial policy, the, the space for industrial policy has narrowed significantly, but you try to make best with what space you have. And that's, for example, argument that's made by Robert Waite, so, uh, who is calling for so-called developmental state mark II. So he says, no longer you can impose high barriers, high, high tariffs as you, as you could. No longer you can, uh, you know, maybe steal technology as you could back in the day. But <clears throat> because some of those, uh, some of those uh, are too hard to do, some of those were banned by WTO, but there are still many things that are allowed, including devaluations or investment incentives or public procurement policy, meaning state uh, can buy from some of the uh, producers in home and other stuff that's, that Wade himself calls market protection uh, or protectionism. And you can also, states can also use the role in bargaining with TNCs to get a good deal, like get, for example, a lot of technology transfer instead of just putting things together. Uh, and also some of the protection is allowed for some sectors, uh, especially for defense sectors. So you, you, you say it's for national security and then you can do whatever you want. And to similar extent, maybe not as much, you can do when you say it's good for the environment. But you can also do this sort of protectionism. Very similar arguments are made by Peter Evans, but on the bureaucratic side. So he says that he's famous for writing about embedded autonomy, meaning how uh, bureaucracy in East Asia allowed for a nurtured private sector to become competitive globally. So he says in 23rd century, there might be new uh, um, challenges to that bureaucracy, but the point still stands. And uh, you, so even even if uh, if that's the embedded autonomy is not enough, you just think of ways in which you produce a bureaucracy that's efficiently meeting uh, the needs of expanding your industry or making this uh, industrial transformation. And his big point now is uh, embedding it in civil society. And very similar points are made by Mariana Mazzucato, maybe actually in, to a larger degree. <clears throat> and then there is a lot of focus on regional level industrial policy as seen as overcoming this problem of state having not enough capacity to enforce its policies. And some of it has been done by Juncker's plan, so-called, which was focusing on investment in real economy. Uh, so partially it's kind of macroeconomic stimulus, but partially not. And I don't know whether you know the M25, that's a trans-European party set up by Yanis Varoufakis and friends, uh, which also has this proposal for new deal for the 21st century for Europe. And it talks about this transition to green economy with the use of industrial policy. 
and a lot of this stuff is focusing on this core periphery divide where you have poorer periphery in Europe like Greece or South and the richer core which produces uh, manufacturing and extracts most of the value from this global value chain and therefore is richer and has better terms of trade and uh, yeah, and creating international commitments, which now are the problem to making industrial policy, but maybe actually the way to overcome it, it is argued, is to create those commitments to actually do it. So countries having bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements on making those. And the last slide on <laughs> with content is that there are some new issues that climate, that uh, the uh, industrial policies might be actually well uh, equipped to address. And that is partially because there are two main reasons for it, which I <laughs> didn't list here, is that industrial policy is about uh, mobilizing resources for a specific need and for inducing a structural change. So that's really important for uh, the problem of climate change and environmental degradation. Um, the, the, whole, uh, prob the whole point that is now being made is that we need the structural transition to economy that is sustainable and that markets don't do it quite fast enough. And so that you actually want to mobilize people to develop new technologies to make or maybe just to make some of those uh, sustainable technologies uh, competitive which needs a, a lot of research so you want to allocate funds in there or maybe you want to design a completely new system of uh, the uh, energy uh, extraction for the rest of the economy that is now so pollutive or, or uh, encourage other the uh, uh, other other investment initiatives then uh, more in terms of uh, what sort of capacity states need because problems like climate change or but also like inequality may be a bit over the top of what are usual capabilities of a conventionally understood bureaucracy of old style bureaucracy there might be people like Mariana Mazzucato argue that you m might want to have new type of bureaucracy that that is so-called dynamic that sets direction for growth not only allows this GDP per capita growth happen and that would solve problems I mean solve it can solve problems like inequality of incomes or wealth it can redistribute fruits of growth better it can set up new rules for uh, uh, the uh, interactions between those transnationals and the state and uh, also in terms of those risky, risky se sectors where private uh, sector, private investors don't always like to invest because there is just a high degree of bankruptcy, state can act as an investor of first resort. So state, when you see that state puts their money in, in there, it may allow for some early discovery that can be um, commercialized and it can allow for to alleviate some of the uncertainty for the investors and actually crowd them in instead of, you know, as I argued, crowding them out. And the point would also be that both risks and rewards are socialized. And right now, a lot of people argue that corporate sector has socialized risks, meaning we take the fall, bay, think bailouts, but not the rewards. The rewards stay with them. And the last point is that there is also, just briefly, this call for progressive industrial policy which often focuses on the supranational level and uh, uh, is uh, highlighting democratic control and also for, talks about this uh, core periphery divide and how to make more equitable, for example, for Europe, not to have such tensions as you know, Greece, Germany in terms of terms of trade. So that's mostly it. And the last one thing, because it's Halloween, uh, the, uh, I'm not sure whether you are aware, the, I mentioned the author of the best industrial policy is none at all quote. It's a very nice man who, who passed away lately and I wanted, to show, uh, I wanted to show his photo and that there was actually more interesting aspects to his life that some people don't realize. So that's him and that's him in his free time. All right, thank you. So we, we probably have uh, time for one question or something if someone has it. No. What's the name of this man? Uh, Gary Becker. So yeah, he's famous for analysis of crime in terms of economic calculus, etc. Yes? So you mentioned globalization as a constraint to economic policies, and you mentioned the sector as an activity as well. 
and then you put coordination. So for one of the examples for this would be the ETS. So um, yeah, the EU emission trading system is probably one of the largest attempts to coordinate yeah. policies. What do you think are the chances of actually coordinating policies at the um, international level, which proves quite difficult to do? Yes. One point that I kind of wanted to uh, talk about but skipped is that a lot of this stuff, uh, I mean, that's you, 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 you sort of nailed it. A lot of this stuff is like we have some ideas, but there are really so many questions that are not answered in the literature, but literature tries to answer, address right now and might not be able to address actually before it comes into, into practice. And one of them is actually how are we making, uh, putting them uh, into, into practice institutionally? So why, you know, why would it be in the interest of Germany or France to actually redistribute uh, the, uh, the uh, value from the, global, from the European value chains better to countries like Greece or, or, or Italy? They're, they have no reason to consciously give up their incomes that to, to, you know, to exacerbate their trade position. And uh, that, that's 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 very that's a very problematic point. And you know, some it might require there are some answers proposed, like uh, you know maybe incremental change of stuff like so stuff like Juncker plans, so one step at a time, just investing at the periphery more. But that's probably not enough. There is a there, you know there is a call to make European Union actually a fiscal union, so it will be more like US, etc. But uh, also at the same time, there is, it's very hard to, I mean, my biggest concern with it is actually how can everyone be core in the European Union? I mean, probably not. And how you deal with it? Then, because what usually happens, core earns much more money, it's much more affluent. So then you need to redistribution of wealth. That's really, really radical. So not distribution of productive powers, but of wealth itself, because he, there is always someone who will be better supplier and you can't have a factory in every small town because that's just not efficient. That's not how the economy really works. So, I mean, this, there is a lot of very problematic points, but my, I would say the whole, the point of the lecture was to, to show more that there are, there are good cases to be made to think about industrial policy in 21st century, even if the answers are not ready because they are definitely not our work out as well as they should be. And yeah, I hope I hope that answers it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I thank you very much for coming. I think we have like five minutes till the next lecture that you might have. But uh, it was it was pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs>